we've been missing you. Do you want to find the witch friends you've been missing? Do you want to participate in these conversations live? And do you want to support the work of recovering a true history of feminist ideas about magic? Do you want to hang out? Do you want an invite to Zoom together with Amy and myself every new moon along with our hilarious, diverse, wise, queer, creative, anti-racist, science, and awe-loving coven? You must join the Missing Witches Patreon. It's pay what you can and we can't wait to meet you there patreon.com slash missing witches you aren't being a proper woman therefore you must be a witch you must be a witch welcome witches welcome sunshine welcome communities minute living on our skins and in the air and in the darkness that we create between our ears welcome friends practitioners of all stripes welcome home to the missing witches podcast Welcome, Kevin, and welcome, Doctor Witch Doctor Julia Skinner. I feel like we're really old friends, and we've just like chatted on Zoom a couple of times. <laughs> it's so fun to have you back. Definite friend of the podcast. We talk about your Oracle deck all the time. I had so much fun digging into this book. It really feels like the natural friend to that deck it's like so much of the history so much of the stories that you have given us insight into insights that are dropped through that deck are now kind of spun out here so I'm so excited to get to talk to you about it do you want to like reintroduce yourself I feel like we're all we're all eternally new (laughs) yeah well thank you for having me on and yeah it's good it's good to see you all and I agree like we were just saying like we feel like we have this like kinship even though we've never met in person very much feel that too yay (laughs) so I'm Dr. Julia Skinner I'm the author of Our Fermented Lives which is a book about the global history of fermentation I run Root which is a fermentation and food history company here in Atlanta It has a newsletter, which is kind of what I'm focusing on right now is like writing for that and generating kind of ideas to share in that space. But it also has classes and I do like consulting for people and all kinds of stuff. And that's uh, that's kind of been the focus of a lot of my work right now has been my writing. So that's a good intro. That's a great intro. (laughs) How are you feeling about the book, the book baby being birthed in the world? How's that process going? I just got my (gasps) advanced copies (laughs) just a couple weeks ago. So I'm feeling really, really good about it. It's, you know, it's, as you know, amazing to kind of see the first iteration of your work come into the world or the first, you know, physical manifestation of it that's not on a screen. And so it'll be, it was supposed to come out in a few months, but paper shortages and everything being what they are, it'll be coming out in September instead. So that's good because that gives me kind of more time to think about how I want to share it with people and all of that. But it feels really nice. I mean, they did a really good job designing it. Like the layout feels really natural and nice to look at. It doesn't feel super crowded or anything. No, I love how... Yeah, Yeah, you kind of can like dip into these deep histories. You can go on these really interesting sort of political economic journeys with you. And then you can drop into these recipes and it's like your grandmother's recipe next to like a (laughs) 3000 year old recipe. It's like, it's really cool. It's well, and it's, you know, it's such a reminder of the power of fermentation and how how this is something that we've been doing and, you know, microbes we've been partnering with since before we were human. Is the art on the cover, it looks like a circle? Is it a circle dance, a microbe circle dance? So it's some people under an arbor, like woodcuts of fairies or something almost. Like they're all (laughs) like, they're all like drinking stuff and dancing around. Like the cover feels very much like old English or maybe like Yatesian, you know, description of fairies. (laughs) which totally. I kind of love. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I love that idea of our microbes as fairies, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do too. And I, you know, I love too, that this is a space where like, you know, when we think about the ways we can apply our magic, like, you know, I, I think often when we think about 
or talk about magic with people, you know, they have specific assumptions about what that means. And like, so it's really fun to see this book be out in the world and be like, this is magical too. And this is this writing, even if it's not writing explicitly about like, you know, the spells I cast or anything like is also a form of magic. And so it's, it's like seeing the book feels like a manifestation, you know, in that way as well. Yeah, and a manifesto. Yeah. <laughs> like low-key, low-key manifesto. Yeah, yeah. just to like, hey, these are your friends. That's the manifesto. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. We've been partnering with these beings forever. Um, one piece that you touched on in the book, I wondered if you would dig into more with us. You you sort of share a pretty personal window into your own experience of food insecurity, poverty, Mm -hmm. you know, living from food kitchens, and also seeing how nutritionally barren that was and being like, not well. Yeah. And then you kind of suggest that finding gardening and fermenting helped both with, anyway, I want you to talk about it, not me to summarize. (laughs) So, you know, it's interesting because I think, you know, uh, my my personal situation with food insecurity was one where you know growing up i grew up in a household where we did have enough food so it was it was not until after i moved out and i was navigating you know going to school and having these super low paying jobs and kind of like figuring out what that looked like and so that was the context in which i experienced that food insecurity i remember after i think it was after i got my phd was the first time I was able to go to a grocery store and just put whatever I wanted in my cart and not like keep a tally of how much money I had in the cart. And I th- like I bought like $400 of groceries. I was just so excited. It was like so freeing. But yeah, I mean, you know, that's it was interesting because until writing this book, I kind of hadn't made the explicit dietary connection in my own life before. I, I had known that, you know, I know a lot of people who ate like crap and then started eating better, you know, started eating more nourishing food and were like, wow, this makes a difference. But I hadn't really made the explicit connection for myself. I mean, in my early 20s, like I felt sick a lot. I would get, you know, get whatever kind of communicable colds and whatever a good amount. Part of it for a while was because I was a bus driver and like, you know, city buses are full of people and all of their, you know, their illnesses that they bring to bear. But it wasn't exclusively that. I mean, I was just like, I was kind of sick, like anyways. And so I started gardening. I started like growing all the stuff and I was like, oh God, there's so many vegetables. There's so like, there's so much, this is great, but also, oh God, I have to figure out what to do with all of this. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of how I got into sauerkraut making. I mean, kind of similarly to how Sander Katz talks about his journey of making sauerkraut being the thing that ultimately pushed him to learn fermentation and get excited about it. I had kind of a similar journey in that way as I started with sauerkraut and then I think yogurt was the next thing. And then I kind of just ballooned from there. I definitely noticed that I felt better afterwards, you know, not only because I had more vegetables and more micronutrients in my body, I think because of the microbes too. I mean, our, you know, our modern microbiomes are very different than they probably would have been thousands of years ago, just because we're eating so much processed food and everything. I mean, I think that story is important to highlight. I I don't think we have listeners who have this kind of assumption about people who experience food insecurity, because I think we tend to attract people who are a lot like a, us in our <laughs> communities. But I think we all have blinders on. And so like, just to, to know the diversity of people that come through a food kitchen, mm-hmm. first of all, is so, especially now, like the cost of food is rising insane in Canada and the US and everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it, it's everyone. It's it's PhD students and bus drivers and moms yeah. and families and whatever. That's not what this podcast is about, but this podcast <laughs> is about whatever the fuck I want it to be about. And, <laughs> and like we, it's food insecurity is, is like this weight that's coming for more and more of us. It's truly diverse. So to think about how we can have these deeper relationships with plants in the more than human world is like witchy and very fucking practical I think yeah well and like so increasingly important you know to think of ourselves as existing within our local environment and within our local food environment I mean we've seen the last few years you can't just like 
go to the big box grocery down the street and get whatever you want anymore. Like sometimes you can, but like at least some of ours, they're definitely still do not always have everything that they used to. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're buying from local folks and you're thinking seasonally and you're thinking of yourself as somebody who eats, but who is eating within a place, like your food security has the potential to be so much stronger because you understand how to navigate place as well as being able to you know, navigate the food resources that exist otherwise, whether place navigation be through foraging or growing your own food or whatever you have access to. I think that's so interesting that there's that relationship between the fermentation as a way of extending our harvest, extending what food we have access to, and then also which I really did not realize the depth of until I read your book, fermentation is the reason we have so many of these foods. Like Mm -hmm. there's this cultural history to so many things that was communities figuring out how to use food, how to transform food, like coffee, tea. I didn't really realize, didn't think of those in that way. Like so many things. I, I remember talking with Sandor a number of years ago about this. And he's like, yeah, every time I encounter somebody who says they don't like ferments, I, I just never believed them. He's like, you don't like coffee. You don't like tea. You don't like wine. You don't like bread. You don't like cheese. Really? <laughs> <laughs> what else is there? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, I mean, so many things. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I guess I never knew what, like, I, I ate miso paste when I was growing up, but I never really knew, like, what it was, and I didn't know that was fermented, right? Like, I didn't, you know, I knew that cucumber pickles were fermented sometimes, but that was maybe about it. It right. was so outside of my knowledge, but yeah, it's like, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere, and it is this relationship. I mean, I, I like how you begin by explaining your approach, the fermentations that you generally give in this book are uh, you don't have to go out and buy like a starter or something like the starters are always right there with you like they're always they're always the first stage in the recipe is now you make the alcohol or now you make Mm -hmm. the yeast (laughs) they're right there when we talk about fermentation that's something I think is really empowering Mm -hmm. in this particular moment is fermentation is truly democratic Like you can have proprietary starters for different things, but you're never going to own fermentation. Like nobody is going to collect all of the lactobacteria in the entire world and be like, nope, these are mine now. You can't have them unless you (laughs) give me money. Like it's just not possible. Right. (laughs) So like, unless you just get rid of literally all edible things so that people can't ferment them. I mean, like people will be able to ferment their food. And so it's like this incredibly empowering thing at a time when I think it's so easy to feel disempowered about what we eat. Mm -hmm. Totally. And then the other piece of this process, this is core to evolutionary history. Like this Mm -hmm. is, it seems tied to why and when we stopped being migratory. It was only when we stopped that we could make things in vessels for long periods of time. I had six ideas while you were talking, so I'm gonna tell you two of them and then just be like, talk more, please. Um, <laughs> the, other, the other thing I loved was you're talking about the non-commodification of it, which I do, I get tripped up when I'm reading, you know, like I think before I read your, your fermentation oracle deck, the idea of making mead and you go look online and it's like, here's the 16 things you need to buy before you start, you know, mm-hmm, <laughs> or like mm-hmm. even, even a fermentation vessel and a fermentation stone. And you talk about different things that people can use that you could just find. My friend Cheryl used to teach classes where she would teach them to low income food and secure kids fermentation classes. And she would just be like, go find a jar or a, you know, something like and so they would all find their thing and bring it and she would show them how to put whatever they were cooking together like make it in that thing so that Mm -hmm. they had immediate access to being like okay I know that I can get this kind of container and when I do I can put you know x and x things in it yeah and I think you know you brought up an interesting point about us being migratory and then not and then kind of expanding our relationship with ferments I mean we had been eating ferments for a long, long time before that. I mean, the reason why, uh, I, I, I mean, like I'm not a biological anthropologist, so like, I don't know, like f- 5 billion years ago or something, I don't know, like a long time ago, <laughs> like 5 million years, something like that. But um, we developed an enzyme to metabolize alcohol. And the reason we did that 
was because we were eating fruit that had fallen and started to ferment. And um, so we had to develop this enzyme in order to be able to continue eating that partially alcoholic fruit. And so it's like we already had like co-evolved with these microbes, but now it was like we could really take that to the next level. And I find that like, like it had to be really exciting to be the people that were first figuring out like how to intentionally ferment things and like the amount of just like excitement and uncharted territory there. Um, I don't know if you remember in the book, I mentioned the Khoisan people in what is modern day South Africa. And um, they're believed to have been the first people to um, have discovered mead, you know, I don't know, like long, long, long time ago. So the story is that they went up to this tree stump that had been rained in that had a natural beehive in it and it had rained. And so this tree stump, it had sat and fermented for, I guess, a couple of days. And so they come up and it's like bubbling and it's like, you know, it's absolutely crazy. And like, you know, imagine going up to that for the first time, like being the first person that ever is like, I see that bubbling tree stump over there and I'm going to eat it. <laughs> I'm going to eat it. That's a good I'm idea. Gonna, guys, gonna guys, guys, it. guys, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> like, surely they already knew what honey was. So it probably wasn't too much of a leap, but Still, that takes a lot of courage to just be like, here's the mystery bubbling thing. Let's see what it does. But they did, and they loved it. This community still makes mead today in their traditional ways. It's incredible thinking about how innovative people were. Like on par was when we think about innovation today, and we're like, oh, this person, you know, had this like genius tech invention and all of this. And like, I'm not trying to dig on the genius tech inventions. I mean, I'm like using a computer and all of this right now, but I think we often do a disservice to the past by assuming that the people in the past were less creative or innovative or intelligent um, than modern humans. So I don't know. That's just like a total soapbox I just got off on, but. <laughs> just jump on it anytime. They're just, I'm just going to sprinkle soapboxes about and you jump on them. Here's another one I want to hear you jump on about. Can you talk about mead wines fermentations and uh you know our relationship with the divine you know alcohol is really interesting because it has been long used in various rituals as something to bring you closer to the gods we often think of different herbs you might smoke and things as doing that but people have traditionally also used alcohol in those ways and sometimes added psychotropic plants to alcohol. The fermentation does, in some cases, increase the psychotropic effects of certain plants or make them psychotropic in the first place. So, you know, that has been a big part of how we've engaged with the divine, but it has been so important to our understanding of the divine. You know, if you think about it, it's this mind-altering substance that is made by this unseen transformation you know, you consume and it kind of makes you feel all these different ways. And I mean, it makes sense that people would be like, wow, like this is obviously magical. <laughs> like, is it, it is. And so we see a lot of different alcohol based sorts of things in traditions around the world. We have alcohol based kind of divinity stories, but the two that I'm most familiar with are Caridwen in Celtic legend, her cauldron of wisdom and inspiration, she would stir that. It was, it was a bubbling cauldron of barley. It was beer. She was making beer, right? And then, of course, the mead of the gods, the Viking mead of poetry and inspiration that was made from the blood of this very wise, wonderful poet who was killed. The gods were mad about it and they made this mead, but then some of it fell to earth and then the humans got it and that's how we have poetry. And like, it's so cool to me that we, I, I am not saying this in any way to diminish the very real effects of alcoholism and dependency, but I think now we tend to talk about alcohol from a very fear-based lens, like we tend to, even outside of the very good conversations we should be having about dependency, you know, we tend to either talk about it either in terms of flavor or in terms of, you know, oh, you can't have more than a tiny bit or it'll just absolutely destroy your health. I'm not saying drink more than you already are or drink too much or any of that, but I'm saying like in the past people people just had a different relationship with it. They could have a glass of wine without being like, oh God, my liver. They could just have it and be like, okay, like now I have had my glass of wine. That was nice. <laughs> 
maybe there's something to be to be gained from thinking about it, you know, not as a magical thing we need to just sit and consume a ton of, but when we are going to sit down and have a glass of wine, I mean, maybe by thinking about it as magical, we can really appreciate that that glass that we're having. Like we can really enjoy that thing. Re sacralizing, making ritual around food and things. It's probably where our idea of these things being portals to the divine in part comes from and Mm -hmm. how we can kind of reconnect ourselves back into sort of unseen dimensions too. The other thing that I was so astonished by, and I feel like it's connected, you wrote about um, fermentation and death rituals. So there's you know, I, I, and I think it's something that I'm kind of still diving into right now, actually. I've been kind of looking around, Marx. It's so, it's so interesting to me. But I think at the core of it must be this sort of like transformation by unseen beings, right? Um, and I think, you know, that transformation, you know, we're watching things rise. We're watching bread rise, for example. So there's the corpse bread um and i think it was like in germany up until i don't know a couple hundred years ago and you would put it on the chest of the corpse and let it rise and the idea was it was you know it was like taking some of that person's essence and sharing it and you know i mean it makes sense because you're watching this thing actually transform you're watching you're watching the bread rise you know you're you're assuming this person's soul is rising out of them already and you know that bread rises when you let it sit. So maybe the person's soul is getting into that bread too. And you're able to kind of keep a piece of them with you. And that, um, that's, I mean, that has to be connected to, to the Christ ritual, right? To transubstantiation. Yeah, I mean, and I think, I, I think it probably is in that case. Um, you know, there were certainly other death rituals that were not, say, like the Egyptian ritual of you know, putting just like a ton of food and wine in somebody's tomb, like, you have to make sure they're able to like party for as long as they want to in the afterlife. Um, Yeah, and that's, I mean, that one's less specifically about, you know, fermentation and more just about kind of like, you know, um, having, having some food and booze there. But um, yeah, I think, I think that sort of transformation, I think, you know, I mean, when we think about the Eucharist. I mean, I, I, I suspect I, I've actually never been baptized, even though I was raised Christian. And so I've never done the Eucharist, <laughs> but, um, but it's my understanding that, yeah, it's very much a like, you know, blood and body sort of situation. Yeah. It's funny, like in that, you know, when I was, I went to a bunch of different churches when I was growing up because I was like rebaptized when my mom remarried and so got to got to try some different <laughs> flavors but um in the like more hippie social justice churches that we went to for a while they would literally make like an unleavened bread it wasn't the wafers mm-hmm. it was it was it was a bread that I picture very much being like like a quick leavening or whatever like you're mm-hmm. t- like you're like I was imagining when you were describing the bread that would sit on the chest of the corpse you know yeah I, know. I mean it's it's interesting as while well, I've not I've not done the Eucharist I've definitely like watched enough other people do it like sure. um so like it the church I grew up in was like a an evangelical church and they would use like those like pre-made pie crust like the Pillsbury rollout ones <laughs> and they would just like prick them with a fork and bake it and then like you would break off pieces as it went by <laughs> I've never heard of that that's awesome <laughs> yeah it was it was really weird like I I I like snuck a couple bites of it once which I don't know like what the you know what sort of like you know punishment you get for that but like <laughs> oh yeah no. I mean it was sneaky awful Jesus sneaky Jesus. yeah <laughs> yeah it was yeah it was really bad and then they would have like Welch's grape juice um okay yeah yeah um I never thought about that okay yeah so that was that was that place <laughs> but I've been other places too where they've had you know like the actual wafer wafers but then like yeah. you talked about like where it was actually like a like a flatbread like mm-hmm. actual flatbread that was like lightly leavened but not like you know a giant loaf right just a just a little guy and I remember them tasting quite sour like I think there was I think I think there was a a mom with a sourdough starter oh okay so that reminds me of two other things I want to ask you about 
I want to talk about misogyny and fermentation because mm -hmm. there there's this there's this sort of line I mean you dig into it in so many smart ways but there were these two moments where I was like oh shit I have to talk to Dr. Skinner about that <laughs> um especially in in Japan in the history of sake I was like well this mm -hmm. it just happens over and over right where it was it seems like it was women mm -hmm. dominated and it was like sacred the relationship between them up until like eighth century or something and then mm -hmm. and then it's like suddenly there's a switch and women can't come in the within a fucking hundred yards because we're yeah. we're, to we're toxic why does that happen what <laughs> tell me about what you think about that <laughs> i mean and we you know i mean we see that in japan we see that in like the history of beer brewing in western europe like we see it all over the place right. and i mean and i think yeah i, I think like you said it it's it's something that was initially considered women's work. I mean, like if you look in ancient Egypt, women would do brewing, but like I think men could only do winemaking because it was too sacred or something. And, you know, part of it is this sort of, you know, this this misogynistic control over our ability to engage with the world and make a livelihood for ourselves. Um, and a desire to say like, oh, well, you're good at this. Well, like, I don't know, I'm a dude. So like, I'm, I'm just going to do it better. Um, but there's also a real economic driver too, which is in a lot of cases, these things were actually affording women economic freedom. And when we have economic freedom, you know, if I'm not chained to my partner, because the only way that I can afford to buy groceries is by him, you know, giving me an allowance or something, like if suddenly I can buy my own groceries, like, am I going to listen to that guy as much? No, not really. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, you know, there was an economic motivator and, you know, it's, it's interesting when you look at a lot of articles about this, because people will say like, oh, well, men were suddenly really interested in brewing. They realized they could make money at it. And yes, like that, that is definitely part of it. But like, why brewing specifically? Why, like, why alcohol making specifically? And I think it has to do with the specific desire to deprive women of our ability to make our own money and have our own self-direction. Right. So it does seem like it's directly tied to that same moment that, and I mean, it's a long moment, but that Sylvia Federici talks about and others that like, as soon as there's a false poverty imposed by early capitalism saying we're taking land, we're dividing it up and you shouldn't be pissed at us magistrates or capitalists, you should be terrified and pissed at each other, especially that old lady over there. <laughs> She's so scary. She's so scary. <laughs> it seems like there's that element. And I don't know if that's the case in Japan as well, but it, it does seem like there's this moment where it's like, oh, there, there's this sacred relationship with nature, with earth, all of this bounty and muchness. And we're understanding these relationships together. And then when we're severed from a sense of bounty by false scarcity, then we have to hate women. If you suddenly envision the world as being made of finite exploitable resources rather than something that you live, you know, in an ecosystem that you're a part of. Right. I mean, yeah. Suddenly everybody's a threat to your slice of the pie. <laughs> like... Yeah. And, and, and I mean, I, I like thinking about it that way as much as it's infuriating mm -hmm. because I have more sympathy for the witch hunters <laughs> for the men in that situation when I think mm -hmm. of them as like scared and hungry. Yeah. I mean, I think for like, for us as modern people kind of trying to undo those legacies and reconsider, you know, what we're going to be like as ancestors. I mean, I think it gives us a good template for thinking about how we might be able to reach people who have that mindset today. Like how, yeah. if this person is terrified that, you know, I'm going to have as much power as them and I'm going to take their pie. Like if I come at it, understanding that, how is it that I can talk with them and help them like help them see that I'm not the threat. Yeah. And like, I don't, I don't know, like, I don't have like the answers for that, but it's a good thought experiment. Yeah. Yeah. How do we see each other as in a place that's, that's bountiful when there's so many pressures telling us that we have to fight each other for scraps mm -hmm. and maybe it has to do with, doing more with our scraps um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to connect that idea of uh, 
future future generations or being good ancestors. Really practically, when you talk about research showing that fermentation is making more more nutrition available to us, and that seems to affect not just our individual health but our our DNA. Can you explain that? So that. So I brought that up in the book, and that's actually something that I personally would also like to dive more into. There are studies that, and this is still very early stage research from, you know, from what I understand, but what we have seems to suggest that having a solid nutritional foundation and particularly having the B vitamins that ferments produce does help, it in some way shapes our DNA in a way that makes it so that we're more resilient and healthy in future generations. Um, wow. it's, it's a thing that I need to dive more into. Um, I, you know, my interviewees that I talked to in this had much more eloquent things to say about it than I did. Well, it's funny when you like, I, this happened to us with the book too, where people would be like, tell us about your research into this. And I'd be like, yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. And you're just like, I've, yeah, that was a thing that happened. <laughs> I, I read a lot about it. I wrote it yeah. in the book. You can read it there been erased for my short <laughs> term right now. I mean like I remember when I was looking at these studies what I found really interesting and the reason why I want to go back to it at some point is because it it led me to wonder if perhaps because this does you know the the ferments the the B vitamins and ferments do actually impact our um, mitochondrial DNA which is you know, what they posit kind of intergenerational trauma is a pathway that that might be passed down. Could we actually use ferments to help, you know, help heal that kind of trauma? And like, I mean, the answer is I have no idea, right? But like, and like nobody else does either. But that's kind of immediately where my brain went was I was like, I don't like quite know the science well enough. on like, I'm definitely not like a microbiologist. So this is definitely in somebody else's purview. But to my mind, my educated guess is like, oh, I don't know. Like, I, I would be really curious if somebody did that study. I would want to read it. So right. like, if somebody's listening who wants to do that study, right. um, let me know. <laughs> well, because it, 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 it exists at this intersection, right? Where, and fermentation in general. And that, that's why I love these windows you give us into it. And especially you in particular, because, you know, you're like a science witch, history witch, you know, like you have both these perspectives, you're open to talking about that with us. But so I love that fermentation exists in this space where we're both like, you can hear my kid stomping above me, sorry. Um, we're both like physically interacting with the material world where something chemical is happening, something biological is happening. But in doing that, we're interacting with human history, familial history, narrative. So it's that that left brain, right brain, like I can see, of course, it would be a pathway to sort of untangling personal mm -hmm. trauma, generational trauma. I mean, you talk about making sew-ins for the first time and feeling like deeply called to do that and then emotional about it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was interesting because I happened I saw something about sew-ins, like I was actually researching something else. I was trying to look at other kind of like Scottish food history things and then saw this thing about sew-ins and I was like what is that <laughs> and yeah. I started diving into it and I was just like I suddenly really want to make this oat thing um and so for anybody who's listening who doesn't know sew-ins is like when you would mill oats the holes that would come off would have bits of starch still stuck on them and so you would ferment the holes and get that starch off of there um and then eat that, you would like cook it down into a porridge or like you would have drinking sew-ins or whatever. There's a bunch of different ways, but yeah. So I made it. And like the first time I made it, yeah. Like I was like pretty much just like sobbing and like eating this oat paste. Like it was, it's good that I live alone. Like it would have been <laughs> a lot for somebody to like walk in on and see. Like, <laughs> they would just be like, um, are you eating paste and crying? Like, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much <laughs> and so but it was it was like for some reason like and I had never tasted it before right I'd had other fermented things I did you know like bread with oats and, and stuff like that but I never had this dish but it tasted so familiar to me mm -hmm. um 
yeah, it was like, it was just so powerful to eat. And I, you know, I know other people who've had that experience. Like one of my friends, um, their ancestors were enslaved and brought across the Middle Passage. Um, they, you know, they don't have access to their ancestral history in the same way I do. And um, they were telling me that they made porridge for the first time. So across West Africa, I mean, through most most of West Africa, like fermented porridges, fermented grain porridges, sorghum, millet, stuff like that um, are very, very common. And they made, I think, a millet porridge and had a similar experience. They had never eaten the soured porridge before. They didn't know what part of West Africa their family had come from, but they still felt this real familiarity with the food. And that's, you know, I think that's one of the powers of ferments is that we have ferments all over the world. And, and you know, every culture has them. And so like, you can use that as a way to kind of build those connections um, both with where you are. I mean, I was thinking about this earlier today about if I'm using something from where I am, let's say I grow oats and I make this thing that my ancestors made on another continent, like I'm not only connecting with my place and my present, but I'm also connecting with that place. And like, there's so much power in, in doing that and in using like a collaboration with living beings of the place where you are now to kind of facilitate that connection mm -hmm. I don't know. another soapbox <laughs> yeah no I mean I mean I think especially in this context we all are people who in our own personal ways engage with ritual and like mm -hmm. take take ritual seriously in a play way or playfully in a serious way um as a you know like that's a real that's a real tool for our, all of us here in this circle so yeah, thinking in depth about how drawing on foods, fermentations, drawing on, on this layer of the world, asking this layer of the world to, to tell me about my history can be super emotional. And I, I mean, you give a couple other examples of fermentations or foods that are so specific, they were almost lost. The ways in which we have or don't have access to the ancestral foods, I mean, does literally shape our bodies in addition to shaping our ancestral knowledge. I mean, I, I talked with Michael Twitty for this book, and he mentioned that the lack of access to fermentation, which is very, very common on the African continent writ large, but like in West Africa, where people were being taken and enslaved from, a lot of different fermented foods are present. And without access to that, if we look at various health crises here in the US that have to do with access and diet, he pointed out that if people of African ancestry had access to these fermented foods, we would be in such a better place health-wise. Not only would we be more connected with our, our family's culinary knowledge and our ancestors' knowledge, but our bodies would be healthier. I think that's in the same section where you talk about memory. Yeah. So when you get like those like brain boost, whatever memory supplements at the store. I usually have a lot of things like B vitamins in them, right? And how do we get these B vitamins? Well, through fermentation. And so it does help with your memory. It helps with your mood. I mean, a lot of traditional ferments are both prebiotic and probiotic. So they have fiber and the actual microbes themselves, which means it's feeding your microbiome, not only with more microbes, but also with like the actual starches it needs. And in doing that, I mean, like there's a whole like nerdy things you can do about the vagus nerve and the brain gut connection. If we're undernourished and depressed and stressed out and all of these things, like our brain won't be working as well in that case either. So they really are powerful allies for our health in all kinds of interesting ways. Right. I was thinking today about how like, you know, it's such a privilege that we have here to spend time building our garden, you know, the brain space at all, you know, let, mm -hmm. al let alone the like physical privilege of, of being able to live here, the brain space at all to think about taking time to gather our scraps. For many people that came from poverty, but, but a different kind of poverty where like now so much of our work life is just all consumptive in front of a computer or in fucking meetings or whatever. So to break away, how did that happen for you that you started to claw out that space in your life 
to garden and then ferment and then like make a life that has room for these ideas? I mean, the gardening kind of came by necessity. I mean, it was something that I wanted to do and I love, you know, I love doing. And so it's like, while it was out of necessity, it's not like it was, you know, oh God, I have to garden. Like it was something that I needed to do because I wasn't getting any vegetables, but it was also something that obviously I wanted to do. And so that's why I stuck with it. I just kept finding myself in the kitchen, you know, like when you have a thing that you're just so passionate about that you just kind of keep turning to it and turning to it maybe without even realizing it. Um, That kind of was my relationship with fermentation. I mean, and I've had that relationship with food writ large, but fermentation especially, it became such an important part of my practice, you know, as a person existing in this world. I mean, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning after I, you know, feed my animals is I make coffee and while, you know, while I'm kind of drinking that and puttering around, I'm like checking my ferments and like straining things that need to be strained or making new things or, you know, whatever. Like that's how I start my day every day. It didn't start out as an intentional effort to do that. It just kind of was what I gravitated towards. And now, I mean, now kind of building in that mindfulness and all of that, I mean, is is critical. Like, I don't know how I existed when I was like such a basket case before and I wasn't doing this stuff. Like, I don't know. I was like so stressed all the time. (laughs) And like, 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 not like I never get stressed now, but I feel like, like, I feel like I recognize that I'm in a, I'm in a position where I'm able to make time for this stuff. And so because I have the privilege to make time for this stuff, I can kind of mirror how that might look for others like maybe that will help somebody else too but just like with my writing coaching I mean if I'm being a terrible writing coach and I'm not following any of the advice I give people I mean I'm not being a useful mirror for them so doing this is not only critical for my sanity but I'm able to justify making time for it because I'm seeing it as kind of helping me build the world I want to see and it's easier to make time to think about world building rather than selfishly doing something just for me, even though that's also perfectly great and wonderful too. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think you cut right to knowing, recognizing, allowing ourselves to know that we need that opening in our lives. And then like spending a lit, like being like, I just, I need the vegetables or like, I, 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 I might be shit at gardening but like I need to go put my hands in the dirt for like 20 minutes this week or like Mm -hmm. I have to cook something like I have to wrench my life away from this rhythm the Mm -hmm. smallest the smallest steps start to make another rhythm make another life I I think I would agree with that and I don't think any of us who have kind of all-consuming you know passions about things started out with it being an all-consuming passion it's more of a slow burn I would make sauerkraut once in a while and, you know, check it and be like, yeah, that's sauerkraut. It took a couple of years for it to really get like super extra. So <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was definitely a process. Um, yeah, but no, I agree with you. That's funny. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then invite anyone who's listening to contribute or ask questions or just say hi. Here's my last one. Can you tell us a couple of ferments? that you either know of or you found in writing this book that you're like, people don't know about this. Like, this is a crazy, because the book is full of them. I mean, the book was full of ferments I had never heard of that are totally doable for me to make. But I was like, I I mean, the cultural breadth and then the breadth across time is really, really fun. Can you give a couple examples to get people excited about how delicious your book is? (laughs) Yeah, so I think that What's interesting about talking about different ferments and what we know and what we don't, I mean, it's so so culturally situated. So like, I'm coming at these from things that I learned about relatively recently as, as a Westerner name, which is a fermented pork sausage. It's pretty easy to make. You, it, it refers kind of to like a garlic ferment of meat. You can have like short ribs that are fermented in this way. It's not always just sausage, but sausage is usually how I make it. And it's delicious. And there's different wild fermented beers. You know, we all know what beer is, right? When I think about 
the kinds of beers that existed historically that we don't think of as much today. I mean, like hops were not always a part of brewing, right? Like grew it, which referred to other bittering herbs, like say mugwort, that, that was something that you would be more likely to see. Like there's also, I mean, creeping Charlie, like the invasive plant that's like in my yard right now. One of its other names is ale hoof. People used to put it in beer to flavor it. Mm-hmm. Like there's all of these different histories around beer too. And just kind of the simple act of malt and, you know, making malt and water into a ferment. But there's a lot of interesting things to explore. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then honeys and pastes and like, hmm, medicine. So many pastes. So many pastes. <laughs> I'll open it up to the coven now. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm Nikki. And I was just thinking, well, so many thoughts exploding right now, <laughs> like fermentation in my brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as a mother of a neuro atypical son who is nine, I'm just curious if you encountered any research about fermentation and neurodivergent friends. And- I didn't encounter a ton. And I don't think it's because it's not out there. I think it was just that it was beyond the scope of the history aspect of my work. But I have heard, and this is completely anecdotally, so this is not like there's a study about it, but like I have had people who are like holistic practitioners and things talk with me about how how they find that ferments are very helpful in the diets of folks who are neuroatypical. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just like, I'm full of curiosity now. I going to go down my own rabbit holes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear what you learn about that. Thank you. I'd be interested in that too. I mean, I think one of the perspectives you take on fermentation is fermentation as meditation. And I think they're alone, just interacting slowly with the food we grow and then we preserve and then we eat. Like, I think, I don't know, for me and my kid, it's become like a part of our days because she's still home with us and it's Mm -hmm. very much it's calming for somebody who is like pretty highly sensitive this is like when we talk about like kind of anecdotal you know evidence around it I mean like you hit the nail on the head like that sort of grounding presence having to be present with all your senses you can't really dissociate and be over here if you're having to be completely in this place I find that helpful It'd be cool if somebody did research on it. I hope somebody does. I'd love to read it. Here's this last piece that I've been thinking about so much since I read it in your book. (laughs) I wish I could show you what's happening outside my window right now, but there's like an (laughs) there's like an axe flying, and I don't. Oh, that sounds really extra. (laughs) Yeah, it's all extra all the time out here. Um. No, I was thinking about this other moment, this other story in your book about, and it's in the death ritual section, Mm -hmm. uh, about letting the bees know. Can you tell that story? Yes. So I love, I love the story or kind of the, the practice of telling the bees. Um, Telling the bees is basically the idea that after, after somebody passes, So bees are really, really sensitive. Like I think, you know, because we are very, you know, human centric creatures and we assume that everything else is dumb and doesn't have feelings. We don't think that bees have feelings. We don't think that, you know, any of these creatures, like we think they're barely sentient, but bees are actually super sensitive and actually will bond to a person. And so when your person, so you are, you are a hive of bees, (laughs) when your, when your person passes, it is the job of the family to go out to the hives and to tell the bees that that person has died. Otherwise, the bees will just go. They will swarm and go somewhere else. And so there's, it's especially in England, but I think it is around other places too, where you tell tell the bees. And that's like a part of kind of the, the mourning rituals and the preparation for end of life stuff. As you're doing funeral preparations, as you're planning all of that, telling the bees is also kind of like a, a part of that practice. How do you think they tell them? Just English? I mean, I, from what, what I understand, you tell them in English, but I think you sit with the bees for a little while. Like you kind of just sit and are sad with the bees, mm-hmm. like have some feelings with the bees. The bees may or may not understand English, but they definitely can understand if you're sitting there mourning. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me that 
they go and and weep and they'll feel an absence and then they'll know yeah. there was weeping that makes yeah. A lot of sense. yeah yeah mm-hmm. there's special little critters mm-hmm. i was reading some stories of uh, traditional ritual dances for goddesses that they're now realizing based on some reinterpretations of translations probably the 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 women the melissa we know they were they were bee goddess they were bee prophets but uh-huh. the, the dances probably actually took the literal shape of the bees dances oh we, cool we know now we've rediscovered that bees have specific dances that uh-huh. communicate specific things and they seems like they probably knew that then too and then that knowledge was lost yeah. for 100 years that's amazing it's such a good example of how colonialism robs us collectively and us individual cultures of our indigenous knowledge and our ways of knowing. And then suddenly we, you know, discover that this is a thing that people knew 10,000 years ago. Right. <laughs> right. How sad and how interesting, but how interesting to think about like where that knowledge is stored, you know? Yeah. And, and so I do like to think about the, the microbes and the bios and the animals and the bees and the bugs as places where that knowledge is you know the stuff that exceeds the archives and we keep finding it again it's there it's in the living world somewhere yeah well and it's you know I mean there's a reason why you know we feel so we feel a certain way we feel moved when we hear these stories or we see these Mm. dances or you know it's like maybe us tapping into that like archive in a in a non-paper you know non- non-human sense Mm -hmm. yeah that living archive yeah when is your book going to be available for pre-order it is available for pre-order um at this very moment Um, oh shit hooray (laughs) um and it will be actually in people's hot little hands in september Um, all right well september 27th something like that We'll include a link for the pre-order the podcast so everybody Yay. can get on this and get excited. <laughs> and pre-orders, if you're wondering, make a huge difference. Yes, to, yes. To authors, they make a huge, huge difference. So if you want to make a loving impact on uh, Dr. Julia Skinner's work, that's a fun <laughs> way. That's a fun way to do it. People can find you at Root Kitchens. Mm-hmm. bookish julia your newsletter is awesome you're doing really cool Thank interviews you. with people <laughs> people like the witches from missing witches but no a lot <laughs> a lot of brilliant academics you're doing really really cool interviews there how can people find and subscribe to this newsletter so that the newsletter is at um, rootkitchens.substack.com there's also a link to it on my website and my social so if you just go to my social it's in there as well um but yeah, there's the free newsletter and then there's like a paid one where you get other fancy stuff. But like the free one also has cool stuff. So yeah. both of them are a lot of fun. It's just like <laughs> fancy and fancier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I know we're going to collaborate on a ritual together for our patrons, our collective patrons and subscribers in the fall. Mm-hmm. But do you feel like leaving us with something that you are doing right now in this season in these days that is part of your practice that helps you so I've been here in Atlanta and I don't know if this is the case for you as well but here we get so many things blooming at once which is beautiful and abundant and also means that like this is why I've been like drinking tea the whole time we've been talking is because like everything is just like a pollen cloud right now and so you know it's been it that allergy thing is whatever but it causes me to like turn to local wildflower honeys a lot and so I've been thinking a lot about wildflower honeys and how I can incorporate those um, this this season and one thing I do every Beltane is I go out in the yard and I take every single wild plant that's edible that calls to me and I put them in a jar and I put in some honey and I put in some water and I shake it up and I make mead. I just let it sit and I check it every day. You can do it on the holidays, but you don't have to. You can do it on the full moon sometimes. I do it on the new moon sometimes. I just do it on like, I don't know, it's a Tuesday. It's a good way to really connect to place and 
to make the medicine of that honey much more personal. When we personalize our plant medicines and our medicines from the natural world, they impact us so much more deeply. I think if people want something to maybe think about this season, thinking of a practice that can really deepen your connection so that you're fully engaging and thinking about reciprocity. I'm making this mead and is there something I can do to help them or help the bees? I love that. How long do you let your mead sit? This is very practical, um, but <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. Um, it really depends. Um, I will usually do about seven days. So what you'll do is you'll shake it up. Don't worry if all the honey doesn't like, like use room temperature water. That's kind of like the big thing, right? Room temperature water, honey, plant stuff, shake it once or twice a day, open the lid and check it, make sure, you know, everything's looking good. You might want to strain the plants out after a few days, you know, like it's depending what you're using, that can be really, you know, that can vary. And then just check it. And I mean, once it tastes the way you want it to taste, it's done. There's no right answer. And so, you know, if I want something that's not really boozy at all, I'll just let it go a few days. But like, most of the time I make it, you know, maybe like four to seven days and it's like a little booze, but not like punchy. If you want to make wine, um, <laughs> use like, use a good amount of honey. So like, I will do, I usually do like an eight to one ratio of water to honey. If you want to make wine, maybe do like a six to one. Okay. Um, and yeah, just let it sit until like, stir it or shake it every day until it stops bubbling. And then, I mean, that means it's it's kind of done getting as boozy as it's going to get unless you do some other kind of more futzy stuff. But it'll be, if it's not like, you know, actually like wine, wine, like it'll still be pretty strong. Like you can make like a definitely strong enough to kind of do something mead in a jar. <laughs> I love your recipes. Just shake it until it tastes good. And then maybe the bubbles aren't there. Well, just nothing. Yeah, it's, a, it's all like, you know, there's no such thing as failure. Even if it doesn't work, you learn something, right? Like I've like, I've had meads grow like all kinds of crazy mold because I like forgot to shake them and stuff. And I'm just like, well, now I have learned. Remember to shake your things. Here you go, garden. Have some delicious yeah, new mold. Delicious just for you. Mm. I love it so much. It's really empowering. I actually wrote about you and about the first meet I made in our next book and this feeling of like, and being on a, on a coven circle and just drinking the, the, you know, the jar of my yellow mead <laughs> and just, just being totally like, um, what's a more, I, I felt, I felt inhabited the next day. Mm -hmm. I felt, I felt in community and, you know, I had been yeah. in a circle of community, but I felt like my, my cells were moving around to make more space for, for community, you know? Yeah. No, I, li I like that idea. It reminds me of, I was talking with Sophie Strand for an issue of the newsletter and she was saying how she was like, if you ever want to experience, you know, the magic of microbes, she's like, drink a glass of wine and just feel kind of like, feel how you feel like you're vibrating. Mm -hmm. Like, it really, it can really make you feel like very much in touch with that. And yeah, it's, it's really special, like community on the micro and macro level. Totally. Thank you again so much for your time. I already can't wait to have you back. Yay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It was so good to see you again. I know you too. <laughs> Always. Someday we'll make our road trip happen. We will. We will dance in the moonlight somewhere on a hill yes that would eat. be very fun i want to i want to eat the uh traveling friendship ferment that you make <laughs> someday <laughs> i'll bring you strange things from our northern gardens excellent yeah it's it's definitely like really funky now it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> like it's good it's good it's just yeah it's it's definitely really uh it's going strong <laughs> it's going strong thanks again thanks everyone yeah. for being here and for listening check out julia skinner's incredible book our fermented lives pre-orders are open now <laughs> love you guys be safe bless if i can be You must be a witch.
Missing Witches podcast is brought to you by the Missing Witches Coven. Join us right now on patreon.com slash missing witches. Blessed fucking be.